Did you hear what I was playing, Len? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry, for your sake, I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately, but I... I play with wonderful expression. As far as the music is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. Speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Rather. Here, sir. Ha, that will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ernest Worthy. How are you, my dear Ernest? It seems you're from town. Oh, pleasure, pleasure. Where else would anyone be anywhere? Think you visualize the algae. Oh, I believe it is customary in good society to have slight refreshments at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? Oh, the country. What on earth do you do there? When one's in town, one amuses oneself. When one's in the country, one amuses other people. And who are the people you amuse? Oh, neighbors, neighbors. Nice neighbors in your part of Shropshire, I see. Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. Oh, how immensely you must amuse me. By the way, Shropshire is your country, is it not? Uh, Shropshire is... Oh, yes, of course. Hello. Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Who's coming to tea? Oh, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. Oh, how perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well, but I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? Well, my dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolyn. I've come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you'd come up for pleasure. I call that business. How utterly unromantic you are. I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. Sure, it is romantic to be in love, but there is nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Right, one may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. But then, the excitement is all over. So shall I... Please, do not touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered especially for Aunt Augusta. You've been eating them all the time! Well, that is quite a different matter. She is my aunt. Oh, have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn devoted to bread and butter. I'm very good bread and butter, you too. Well, my dear fellow, may not, may not eat as if you're going to eat it all. You behave as if you're married to her already. You're not married to her already. And I don't think you ever will be. What for? You say that. Well, in the first place, Girls never marry the men they flirted. Girls don't think it right. Oh, what nonsense you talk. It isn't nonsense. It is the truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors one sees all over the place. Secondly, I don't give my consent. Your consent? What nonsense you talk. But my dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, we're going to have to clear up the whole question. Of Sicily. Sicily? What on earth do you mean by Sicily? What do you mean, LG, by Sicily? I don't know anyone with the name Sicily as far as I remember. Then bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room the last time he had dined here. Yes, sir. You mean to say you've had my cigarette case all this time? To goodness, you would let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. There's no good offering a large reward now that the thing is found. I think that is rather mean of you, Ernest. I must say. However, that makes no matter at all. Now that I look at the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't yours after all. 
course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times. Besides, you have no right whatsoever to read what's inside. It's a very ungentlemanly thing to read our private secret case. Oh, it is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. One should read everything. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware of that fact, and I do not wish to discuss modern culture. It isn't something one should discuss up in private. I simply want my secret case. Yes, but this isn't your secret case, is it? This secret case belongs to someone of the name of Sicily. And you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Sicily happens to be... My aunt! Your aunt? Your aunt? Yes, charming old lady she is. Lives in Tumbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, Ali! Yes, but why did she call herself... Little Sicily, if she's your aunt and lives at Tumbridge and Wells. From Little Sicily, with her fondest love. My dear Algy, what is there in that? For heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. Yes. What? Why does your aunt call you her uncle? From Little Sicily, with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack. I, ca I can't quite make it out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It's Ernest. It isn't Ernest, it's Jack. You have always told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest looking person I have ever met. And you're saying that your name isn't Ernest? That is perfectly absurd. It's on your cards. Here's one of them, Mr. Ernest Worthing. I shall keep this as proof if you ever attempt to deny to me or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else. Well, my name is Ernest in town, and Jack in the country, and the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that does not account for the fact that your small aunt Cicely, who lives at Tumbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle Jack. Come on, boy, you have much better have the thing out at once. Produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now produce your explanation and please make it improbable. Dear boy, there's nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Thomas Cardrew adopted me when I was a little boy, under particular circumstances, and left me all the money I possess, made me in his will, guardian to his granddaughter, Cecily Cardrew. Sicily, who addresses me as uncle from motives of respect, something you can't possibly appreciate, lives in my place under the charge of the Admiral Governess, Miss Prism. Why is that place in the country, by the way? There's nothing to do, my dear boy. You're not invited. Well, go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Algy, I don't know whether you'll be able to understand my real motives. You're hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of guardian, one must adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And in order to get up to town, I've always pretended to have a younger brother by the name of Ernest, who lives in Alban and gets the most dreadful scrapes. That is the truth, pure and simple. The truth is really pure and never simple. What you really are is a bumbrous. That's quite right in saying you're a bumberist. You are one of the most advanced bumberists that I know. Bumberist? What on earth do you mean by a bumberist? Well, you see, you have invented a very useful younger brother by the name of Ernest. And I have invented a perfectly invaluable invalid by the name of Bumbery, in order for me to go down into the country whenever I choose. What nonsense? It isn't nonsense. Bumbery is perfectly invaluable. See, for example, if it wasn't for Bumbry's extraordinary bad health, I wouldn't be able to dine with you, should I? The Willis. So I've been really asked to haunt our crystals for the past week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. Completely careless of me. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. You better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the slightest intention of doing so. I dine there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. Secondly, 
Whenever I do dine there, I am either sent down with no women at all, or two. Thirdly, I know perfectly well whom she's going to place me next to. She's going to place me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. It isn't pleasant. It, it, it isn't even decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It's simply washing one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed bumbress, I want to talk to you about bumbering. I want to tell you the rules. I'm not a bumbress. In fact, if I marry a girl like Gwendolyn, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I'm going to kill my brother in any case. Cecily has grown too much fond of him. She's always asking me to forgive him. And that sort of thing is quite a bore. So, I'm going to get rid of him. And I suggest you do the same with your Mr. Your invalid friend with an absurd name. Nothing, and I repeat, nothing will induce me to part with Bumbery. And if you ever do get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you'd be glad to know Bumbery. Any man who marries without knowing Bumbery has a very tedious time of it. My dear Algy, if I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she is the only girl in the world I ever saw whom I would marry, I wouldn't need to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You see, you don't understand. In marriage, three is company, and two is none. Don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. My dear friend, it isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such a lot of beastly competition about. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Now, if I get her out of the way for 10 minutes so that you may have the opportunity to propose to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you tonight at the Savoy? Well, I suppose you want to. But you must be serious about it. You see, I hate people who aren't serious about their meal. It is so shallow of them. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you're behaving very well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. It's not quite the same thing. In fact, two things rarely go together. What do you mean? You are smart. I'm always smart, am I not, Mr. Worthing? You are quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I'm not that. You will leave no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. I'm sorry if you're a little late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call upon dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since her husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. She seems quite 20 years younger. And now I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Yes, certainly, Aunt Augusta. Gwendolyn, won't you come and sit with me? Thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Good heavens, Lynn! Why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially for Aunt Augusta. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for any money. That will do, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers. Not even for any money. It really makes no matter, Ashton. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury. It seems to me to be I hear her hair has turned quite cold from grief. Certainly has changed its color. From what cause, I of course cannot say. Thank you. I've got quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I'm going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. She's such a nice woman and so attentive to her husband. It's delightful to watch them. Uh, well, Aunt Augusta, I. I think I may have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight after all. I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your uncle would have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. Well, it is a great bore. And I need to say a terrible disappointment. I've just had a telegram sent to me. 
saying that my poor friend Bombery is very ill. I seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange that this Mr. Bombery seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, poor Bombery is a dreadful invalid. Well, I must say, Algernon, that it is high time that Mr. Bombery made up his mind whether he was going to live or to die. This shilly shallying with the question is absurd. Nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Of course, if you are obliged to be beside the bedside of Mr. Bombery, then I have nothing more to say. However, I would be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bombery from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse this Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation. Well, I'll speak to Bombery, Aunt Augusta, if he's still conscious. And I think I can promise you that he'll be all right by Saturday. Of course, the music is a great difficulty. I'll run over the program I've drawn out for the evening, if you will kindly accompany me to the next room. That is very thoughtful of you, Algernon. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Mama. Charming day it has been, Miss Fanny. Pray don't talk to you about the weather, Mr. Worley. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I would feel quite certain that they, make, that they mean something else. And that makes me so nervous. Well, I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has you suddenly coming back into a room that often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any other girl I have ever met since I met you. Yes, I'm quite well aware of the fact, and I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. There's something in their name that inspires Ernest. absolute confidence. In name the moment Algernon first mentioned confidence. to me, they had a friend called Ernest. I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn. Passionately. Darling, you have no idea how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. But you don't mean to say you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. Uh, yes, I know. But supposing it wasn't, you mean to say you couldn't love me then? Personally, darling, I don't think the name quite suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has music of its own. It produces vibrations. Well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say there are other much nicer names. I think Jack. For instance, charming name. Jack! Now there's very good music in the name Jack. If I need to all indeed. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I've known several Jacks, and they are, without exception, one more than usually plain. The only really safe name is Ernest. We must get christened at once. Hmm? We must get married at once. There's no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing. Well, Surely, you know that I love you, and you would let me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you're not completely indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing is considered all about marriage. The subject hasn't even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And, to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it would only be fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand, that I'm fully determined to accept you. Gwendolyn. Yes, Mr. Worthing. What have you got to say to me? Well, you know what I've got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolyn. Will you marry? Of course I will, darling. How long you've been about it. I'm afraid you have, you have had very little experience in how to propose. My own one. I have never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but when you have proposed to practice, I know my brother 
about the trousers. All my girlfriends tell me so. What wonderfully bright eyes you have, Ernest. I hope you will always look at me just like that, especially when there are other people present. <gasps> Mr. Warley! Rise up from this simmering common posture. Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I'm engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, you're not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I, or your father, should his help out, even inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise. Pleasant or unpleasant, as the case may be. It is hardly a matter she could be allowed to arrange for herself. And now, I have new questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. Um, I would be glad to answer your questions very rapidly. You really if you know the answers to them. Mama's questions are sometimes peculiarly intrusive. I intend to make them very intrusive. And while I'm making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. But, Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn. Yes, Mama. Gwendolyn, the carriage. Yes, Mama. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Uh, uh, I prefer standing, Lady Bracknell. I feel bound to tell you that you're not down on my list of eligible young men. However, I am quite ready to enter your name should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Uh, uh, well, I must admit I smoke. I'm pleased to hear it. A man should have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. Very good age to be married at. I have always been of opinion that a man who desires to get married should either know everything or nothing. Which do you know? Uh, I know nothing. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. What is your income? Uh, uh, about 7,000 or 8,000 a year. In land or investments? Investments, Chief. That is satisfactory. Land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it. That is all that can be said about land. Uh, well, I do own a country house with some land, of course. About 1,500 acres, I believe. But I don't depend on that for my real income. As far as I can make out, it's the poachers who can make anything out of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple and unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to live in the country. Oh, well, I do own a house in Belgrave Square, though it's currently let by the year to uh, Lady Bloxham, though I can get it back whenever I like it. Six months notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Uh, oh, she goes by very little. She's a lady quite considerably advanced in years. Ah, uh, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. Are your parents living? Uh, well, Lady Bracknell, I'm afraid I have lost both my parents. Both? To lose one may be considered a misfortune. To lose both seems like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in commerce or did he rise to the ranks of aristocracy? Well, Lady Bracknell, I'm afraid I really don't know. You see, I said that I lost both my parents, but it would be nearer to the truth to say that they have lost me. I don't know who I am by birth. I was, well, I was found. Found? Yes, uh, old Thomas Cardew, uh, old gentleman of very charitable and high disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he had a first-class ticket to Worthing at the time. Why did the child of a gentleman who had a first-class ticket for Worthing find you? In a handbag. In a handbag? Yes, uh, a black, big leather handbag with handles. Uh, quite ordinary handbag, in fact. In what particular locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? 
in a cloakroom at Victoria Station. A cloakroom at Victoria Station? <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate bred, in a handbag, whether it handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for ordinary decencies of family life. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion, but it could hardly serve as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. May I ask then, what would you advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. I don't see how that could be possible for me to achieve. I could produce the handbag at any moment. It's in, the, it's in my dressing room at home. I'm sure that'll satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing her only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with the handbag. Good day, sir.